to invite uh, Nandini to please uh, take over this because she's going to be moderating and uh, coordinating this panel. Please give them a round of applause as constituted. And in Yeshua. Thank you. We're thinking this morning or this afternoon, if you like, about African securities exchanges and what they can do, what we can all do collectively in this room together uh, for, to position and to promote greater flows. So to get us started, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to ask each of my distinguished panelists, all of whom offer different perspectives uh, to the question, to introduce themselves very briefly. Please give us your name, your title, and the perspective uh, from which you come from. And actually, I think I will go, uh, go left with Salua first. Thank you very much, Nandini. And first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Asia, the African Securities Exchanges Association, uh, and Oscar Onyema uh, and uh, the NSC, as well as obviously uh, congratulating Karim here that has just been appointed as president of Asia. Uh, to invite me on taking part of this uh, conference. I'm very delighted to be here. I hope I'm not t eating too much time here. Um, so obviously I'm Selwa Chakri, Managing Director of uh, SEL Advisory, a strategy consultancy firm that is focused on the development of capital markets in Africa as well as in the Middle East. Um, I work a lot with investors and I think that's why I'm here uh, today, is to give the perspective of uh, those investors that are sitting outside of Africa uh, and what they're looking for when looking at uh, African markets. Thank you. Garrett. Before I break this, um, thank you. And uh, thank you also to Asia and uh, the team for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Gareth Allison, Executive Director, MSCI. I uh, look after MSCI's bio, uh, business in Sub Saharan Africa, which involves working with uh, institutional retail investors uh, globally and locally. Uh, shining lenses and transparency into the area of investments, whether that be through our index, analytics, ESG research, or real estate benchmarking tools. Thank you, Gareth. And to my right, if, if anyone doesn't know who he is, I don't know where you've been all morning, but Kareem, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Nandini. I'm Kareem Haji. I'm the president of uh, the African Securities Exchanges Association and also the CEO of Casablanca Stock Exchange. I have been CEO of Casablanca Stock Exchange since 2009, just after the financial crisis. Not the best time to join the stock exchange, but uh, we had to deal with it. And uh, my main uh, objective uh, while at Casablanca Stock Exchange was to improve liquidity and also help finance SMEs. And we've put together a program to uh, actually uh, build capacity uh, for SMEs so that they can better access capital markets. And I'm uh, really delighted to, uh, to be uh, the new president of ASEA after my good friend Oscar, who, who left a strong legacy in the association. And our objective is really to build on this uh, strategy that Oscar has put in place, 2019-2023, uh, which is a strategy that will uh, focus on enhancing uh, liquidity, uh, making uh, development more sustainable uh, and helping build capacity for all uh, market stakeholders. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Mary. My, na my name is Mary Duke, and I'm the acting D Director General of Securities and Exchange Commission, Nigeria. I'll be speaking, well, I've been acting director for the last um, about eight months now. And um, I'll be speaking as a regulator. I'll be looking at the challenges and some of the opportunities that exist in uh, securities exchanges you know, in Africa. And as you know, we have um, a 10-year capital market plan that uh, we have been working with to develop the market. And in that plan, there are a lot of initiatives that are there that will help us in, uh, develop the capital market. And we have been working uh, with some of those initiatives to help develop the market. And we'll be talking about some of those initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. And Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Kassoni, and I'm the chief executive at Stambik IBTC Holdings PLC. We are the sixth uh, most capitalized company listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. And we are an end-to-end -end financial solutions provider members of the Standard Bank Group. 
We have some market leading businesses um, operating in Nigeria. So for example, we have the um, largest stockbroking business in the country. Uh, we run the largest custody business. Uh, we believe we are leading investment banking franchise in Nigeria. Our pensions business is the biggest, as well as our non-pension um, asset management business, amongst others. Uh, today, I'm glad uh, to be joining this distinguished panel, and I'll be highlighting some of the challenges as well as the opportunities that exist um, around African exchanges. Thank you. Thank you, Hinka. So really to sum up, we have around us now a perspective from each of the significant stakeholders in the capital market ecosystem. We have the exchange, we have the advisor, we have the index provider, we have the issuer and the banker, and we have the regulator, all important. Now to get us started, the title of our session um, this afternoon is Position African Securities Exchanges to Attract Greater Global Flows. And to get us started, I really want uh, to put into perspective, use three numbers that I want you all to think about as, we, as you yourselves uh, think about the solutions and the opportunities ahead. The first number, in 2014, the World Investment Report um, said that global investment needs are between five to seven trillion US dollars a year. And 3.3 trillion to 4.5 trillion of that is for emerging markets. So that's number one, number one. The second number that I want you all to hold in your heads is that since the mid 90s, net international portfolio equity inflows into emerging markets have grown dramatically. Uh, they're now over 955 billion US dollars. We're looking at the period between 2000 and 2017. That's the second number. And the third number, the most important number arguably, is that the number of exchanges have grown. There were about 50 in 1975, and now there are over 160 uh, worldwide. So holding those three numbers in your head, I want you to think a little bit more about our subject. In 2017, the WFE and the UN wrote a paper together. It was titled, The Role of Stock Exchanges in Fostering Economic Growth and Sustainable Development. Um, in the week ahead, probably, we are going to publish at the WFE, WFE Research, and our head of research is here today, um, is going to publish another paper. And the title of this paper is What Attracts International Investors to Emerging Markets. We had several key findings, look out for it, the paper will come next week, one of which I want to leave with you. The greatest predictor of foreign inflows into emerging markets is emerging market equity returns. The positive relationship is seen both at the level of individual market returns as measured by changes in the broad market index for a specific market, as well as at the emerging market level overall as expressed by returns of the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. So a one percentage point increase in domestic returns is associated with a 24.4 million US dollar increase in monthly inflows in the average market, while a one percentage point increase in MSCI Emerging Markets Index returns is associated with a monthly inflow increase of 16.47 US dollars on million in the average market. So now, to get us started, I'm going to ask each of you on my panel to give me what you consider the three greatest challenges that you face or that exchanges face to attract you know, these inflows, and we'll go from there. So shall we, in fact, Salua, why don't we go first with you? Sure, thank you very much. Um, so the three things and the three key uh, challenges, and I speak a lot with uh, investors, obviously uh, uh, within, but mostly uh, outside of Africa, based you know in London and New York. And one of the key element, of course, and this is probably going to come up several times, is a lack of uh, liquidity. And of course, there's different ways that markets can try and improve liquidity, and perhaps we will discuss that. But the second biggest thing that they mention is uh, the the transaction cost, which is extremely high, and that actually. Um, poses a detriment to the uh, development of uh, capital markets, uh, specifically in Africa. And I know some of the transaction costs are not necessarily within the remit of the exchange when you look at uh, uh, capital gain taxes, 
But the exchange have to work alongside regulators and policymakers to make sure that they create an enabling environment uh, for investments, right? So capital transaction cost is, is certainly a big thing. The second thing uh, that I'd like to uh, highlight that is extremely important, and there is a perception, of course, it's, a, in my opinion, a, not always a justified one, but uh, a perception of lack of transparency. And to a certain extent, it is true. Uh, within uh, capital markets in Africa and accessing the data, making sure the data is accurate, uh, is reliable, and it's available on a real-time manner, uh, poses a lot of issues for uh, investors outside of, of the continent. And it's absolutely critical to have that right simply because uh, when you have someone that sits in New York and wants to invest in Africa, he or she needs to ensure that they have uh, the right information to enable them to make very well informed investment decision, and that is accessing the data in real time in an accurate manner. Now, exchanges across the, the, the continent in Africa are already doing that, right? So they provide real time uh, pricing feeds data uh, in many ways. Um, one of the areas that is very key, especially, especially for the ones that are the exchanges that are uh, pretty much in an infant uh, level, is to ensure that they capture the content and then they commercialize uh, the data. So when they start at the level where they start commercializing the data, they have to have a, a level of capacity before they start doing that, right? So in order to not just generate revenue, but making sure that there's a right, right uptake. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention when it comes to, uh, to data is becoming a little bit more sophisticated for the exchange in the sense that um, starting to uh, um, sort of partner, and I think uh, Gareth can talk about it a little bit more, uh, start to be a bit more sophisticated with the level of content that is uh, provided by the exchanges. Of course, you know, there's market data, information, reference data, but also potentially uh, partnering with certain index providers to uh, make sure that they have uh, a, a joint index that uh, they could offer to uh, to uh, the market. So that's that's uh, that's a sort of second point. The the last point that I'd like to um, uh, to talk about uh, in terms of challenges, and again, we, I'm sure we are going to hear that a lot in this panel, but also uh, in, in the coming ones, is that the lack of uh, product range offering within. Uh, exchanges and capital markets in Africa generally. So when we look at uh, our continent, we have you know mostly equities and and um, and fixed income securities. But African investors that are looking at Africa are looking at ways to uh, diversify and mitigate their risk. And uh, often the uh, offering of derivatives product could be a good product that will help them to. Uh, uh, better manage their risk exposure and hedge, hedge their position. So that is another key one. And we are seeing that actually in the continent where a lot of the markets, obviously there's Kenya, Morocco, uh, Egypt, as well as Nigeria, that are putting regulatory uh, um, framework in place to allow for the launch of, uh, of those products. So this could be, a, a, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's an opportunity and good news. Th thank you, uh, Salua. Gareth, why don't you go next? And I was lo really looking uh, for the challenge. Sure. Um, I think to pick up on what Salu has talked about, if we look at it from an access and a couple of couple of comments have come through in a few of the presentations this morning, I think the biggest challenge I think we see when we talk to investors both ways, uh, when we talk to domestic exchanges and we talk to international investors, it's the friction issue. Mm -hmm. It's the removing of obstacles of investment, uh, the ability to get in, trade, have the same rights that can come down to you know, simple things like uh, uh, FX, account set up, time to get, you, you can get in, you can trade the currency, but account set up, custody, time on, time on the ground, you know, it comes, it comes into, into account. I think the other thing, we're talking equity capital markets here, is to also remember we're part of an ecosystem, um, and that ecosystem, I think, uh, especially in Africa, is one, also one of the challenges. So when you look at the market structure, uh, the market structure itself may not be as easy for equities as, as it may be elsewhere. So when you've got a market in Africa where interest rate range from anywhere from 65 to 14 to 15 percent, um, and you've got a highly volatile equity market, the risk return payoff when you collect, even before you take into macro events, political events, you know, that can have a challenge for markets to grow from an equity perspective. And I think that also then leads to the product development on the back of that. So that's probably the second uh, uh, challenge. And the third is, is, is perception, and, and I think ASEA and, and, and have got to take a, a big role in a lot of the changes as well for 
really portraying a, a, a vision of governance, sustainability, and going beyond, uh, I think, where if, even if you look at some of your uh, you know, frontier, let alone emerging and developed market uh, peers, in terms of stated goals around governance, integration of governance and sustainability into your approaches, I think has gone, you know, going so hopefully some way to uh, laying those, uh, that challenge. Thank you, uh, Gareth. And actually, both you and Salua have mentioned corporate governance straight out of the, uh, out of the gate. Uh, so we'll come back to that later. Uh, I want to say that the forthcoming WFE paper uh, actually says that markets where a full set of well-established corporate governance requirements are present show additional foreign inflows as high as 765 million, uh, 756 million US dollars over the sample period. But Yinka, you are the practitioner. Uh, tell us your perspectives. Thank you. I think the first that comes to mind is the challenges dealing with regulators. Uh, sometimes yes. across some of our countries we have uh, very um, hostile regulations that discourage investors. Not directly, but the regulation of companies listed on the stock exchange or companies that potentially would seek a listing the way regulators deal with them sometimes are not uh, very friendly. And therefore, um, investors around the globe are a bit challenged um, putting their money in some of our exchanges. Uh, related to that, you see some regulators even seeking to control prices uh, of services and therefore, therefore curtailing the growth, potential growth of those entities. Um, I think the second challenge that I see from Lagos, uh, based in Lagos, would be what I can call political challenges. Every time there's a cycle of transition from government to government, uh, investors typically develop a wait-and-see attitude. And therefore, the kind of trajectory or growth that you may have seen slows down uh, potentially. Um, and thirdly, um, would be a macro um, challenge. Uh, though some of the countries in Africa uh, posted some of the nicest growth numbers, uh, but the reality is that some of the biggest markets are still struggling. Uh, South Africa in recession, Nigeria out of recession, but growth at two point, um, less than 2% when population is growing at more than 2% is challenging. Um, from my point of view. Thank you. Mary, this seems an appropriate moment to ask, uh, to ask you to, to tell us about your challenges um, as the regulator. You, know, you have a twin mandate both of ensuring investors are protected and markets have integrity and of developing the capital market in this nation. Thank you. Um, you know, as a regulator, particularly one, like you rightly say, that is, um, um, whose mandate is to both uh, develop the market and also regulate it. Um, and I can imagine that is what also obtains in some other African countries. There's a lot of challenges. And the first one I will talk about is the issue of the size and the uh, size of the market and, um, and the lack of, you know, product, investable product, you know, in the market. For, for, for you to, to, inv uh, to attract flows into the market, you have to have a market that is sizable, a market that um, can absorb whatever uh, uh, inflow that is going to come in. For instance, um, if um, your market is attractive enough and then you want a lot of money comes in, if there is no, no, no products and then the size of the market cannot absorb it, there's really nothing you can do about it. And um, in terms of the, the size of the market, uh, we have been working a lot in that direction. You know, we are engaging um, uh, different um, uh, stakeholders, you know, to be able to ensure that the market is um, expanded, you know. And then you, you also, like he said, talk about the macroeconomic issues. That is also um, a big issue because uh, in, investors look at stability in exchange rate policies, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in interest rates as compared to what obtains in other markets. If they are sure, if you are not sure that they're going to be able to take out their money when they bring in, they're not going to be able to come to that market. And then um, we also talk about the issue of um, interest rates as you know, it concerns other markets, because if they find better and attractive market, 
they are likely to either divest or hold on to their investment until when it is um, uh, uh, the, the investment climate is, is better for them to invest. And we also, um, another challenge is the issue of um, illiquidity in the market, which also ties to um, the macroeconomic policies, as in being able to take in and bring in their, their monies as and when they really need to do that. Um, if, you, if, if you have an illiquid market, it is difficult for investors to even come to the market or issuers to also issue shares because um, the cost will be very expensive and then, of course, there will be no, um, uh, you won't have a lot of uh, um, market, you know, to really absorb whatever issues that they come for. So those are the three challenges, quick challenges that we have. Thank you, Mary, and I'm sure everyone in this room would like to work with you to resolve those challenges. Um, Kareem, you are the brave market structure operator. You are the exchange charge. You know, on, your, on your shoulders is both the burden of responsibility that comes from running the regulated national market and also the weight of aspiration of leading your nation's development goals. What are your challenges? Well, the, the three main challenges uh, in our exchange are first and foremost, of course, liquidity. Liquidity uh, is a, uh, uh, the main challenge facing most uh, African exchanges, and it has to do with the uh, uh, lack of offer of, uh, of paper, new paper. We don't have enough new companies joining the market. Every year, I, myself, and my team, we visit over 200 companies to try to attract them to the market. And I must say, I'm not that successful. I don't get that many. This year, I only got two companies to join the market, whereas uh, just prior to the uh, financial crisis, we had 10, 11 companies uh, going public. So it, it is very difficult to attract companies to the market because people are shying away from transparency. The transparency is a second issue which I was coming to. Transparency is a very big issue. Uh, entrepreneurs uh, are not necessarily keen on sharing their information with competitors, with tax authorities, and so forth. So it is complicated. Uh, unless you get more government-owned companies uh, being listed, it's very difficult because our exchange itself was developed in the 1990s thanks to a big privatization program. Uh, we had many utilities and uh, banks and uh, other uh, government-owned companies which were privatized, and that really helped improve liquidity at the time. Now, what happened is that uh, the uh, institutional investors needed all that paper to basically uh, invest in, in long-term uh, assets, right? So they soaked all the liquidity from the market, and today we, we're left with uh, only 15% uh, free float, which is a real challenge. The third one, the third uh, challenge, is that we need to improve governance. We need to improve corporate governance and disclosure and so forth. So regulators there can really help us work on corporate governance uh, requirements for, for listed companies, because we don't uh, set ourselves the standards for uh, companies which are joining the exchange. The regulators do. And I think corporate governance has a key role to play. Uh, when you improve corporate governance, you improve performance, you improve, you, you attract more capital flows from inside and the outside. Thank you. I'm not going to spend this panel uh, talking about the challenges alone because every, when there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity. And what we need to speak and find consensus on together in this room and in this panel is how we now move forward to embrace that opportunity that lies within this room. Uh, and Gareth, may I ask you first, I mean, you're the index, you're MSCI, the great MSCI. What is the, what is the opportunity? Look, I think it's, it, it's not new. I think the opportunity is, and it's been mentioned this morning, is the ability to leapfrog other, other areas, other exchanges, other countries, other regulators, learn from the mistakes. These, these markets are in such a, uh, to, the, to, long, to a certain extent, in a nascent phase. 
uh, where there's not significant derivatives, not significant legislation. Um, so these markets can learn, they can leapfrog, it was the word that was used in, the, in, the, in Oscar's interview a, a few moments ago, um, and put in place the infrastructure needed uh, from the start and not have to worry about uh, uh, you know, historic legislation uh, uh, that, that, that could be uh, more, more binding. I think with that, at the same time, the exciting part is the technology aspect. Uh, I think the technology is now making the conversion of the informal to the formal um, market, uh, bridging cross sectors, telecoms, markets, banks, uh, are all uh, sort of now available in that sort of, let's call it ecosystem. And I think new ways of thinking through that ecosystem and how we share uh, uh, data. Um, and I think the biggest opportunity is in, is in the sustainability. I think if I look back at you know, South Africa and the conversations, a lot more institutional capital now is going into uh, sustainable investment. Big global universal owners are looking for uh, long-term return on their capital that is sustainable. Um, and they're looking for projects, whether that be infrastructure, let's say unlisted investments, they're also looking in the listed space. So Karim, to your point, focuses on, on, on governance is one that's definitely uh, uh, coming through. Thank you. Karim, do you agree? Yes, I agree. And I would also add the capacity building of companies because we realized that Casablanca Stock Exchange, that companies often didn't want to list because they did not understand capital markets and what the requirements are to be listed. So we put in place a program uh, which was actually initiated by London Stock Exchange a few years back in Italy, which is called Elite, where we have now 90 companies, both in Morocco and in West Africa, which are participating in this program and we're helping companies acquire the skills needed to basically access capital markets. It's in three phases. First phase is a training program uh, where we go uh, around corporate governance, uh, business plan and things like that so that companies are more familiar with what uh, investors require. The second phase, they're helped by an ecosystem of accountants, lawyers, investment bankers, private equity investors, and so forth, who help them put in place an equity story so that they can move to the third phase where they can actually raise funds, not necessarily through the stock exchange, could be private equity, could be uh, just debt on the market. Uh, that's the phase we call get value. So that's really, uh, I think it's a very powerful tool to basically bring more companies to the stock exchange in the, in the near future. Okay, Mary, you are the regulator. What is the opportunity now um, in front of us? Okay, thank you. I'd like to emphasize again the opportunities that we have in respect of uh, infrastructure. You know, uh, um, Aruma said it, and I'm tempted, you know, not to say it again, but it's very important. Because wherever you turn, you have a lot of infrastructure needs, whether it's in power or it is on the roads, that you need to move goods and services, or even housing, anything. There are a lot of infrastructure deficits. And for me, this lies the greatest opportunities that the, that, uh, the markets you know, can really utilize, and even institutional investors that can really move funds you know, into this area to help develop African infrastructure. And if that is done, I, I believe that um, there will be a lot of potential you know, for um, African uh, exchanges, uh, African capital markets to expand. We have products, you know, that um, we can move this into. You have the green bond um, uh, uh, securitization, or you have um, um, revenue bonds and all of that. So for me, that is one of the greatest um, opportunities that we have. We also have opportunities uh, in like he said, leveraging technology. Technology has come to stay, whether we like it or not. And I mean, it, it's, um, I would say technology is an enabler. You know, it can help us reduce cost, cost of transactions in the market. Because you now see people that can sit down, you know, in the comfort of their bedrooms and trade, you know, if we properly deploy technology, you know, into our market. They, they can trade, buy whether from, um, or from secondary market or even through EIPO from the primary market f uh, from, through the comfort of their, of their bedrooms. And then they will cut off all of the um, costs associated with issuing uh, securities. 
And then these new technology companies, you know, together with SMEs, can also become instruments that can be traded in these exchanges, therefore increasing um, the, 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 the product offering that we have in the market it, and instead of the old faithful equities and bonds that we also have. Another opportunity has to do with interjurisdictional um, collaboration, you know, bit in the region. Uh, Misote uh, mentioned it a bit. I know that a lot of regions have um, integrated, but what stops um, us, whether as a, as a continent as a whole or a region, you know, integrating and becoming one big market? In this continent or within the region, you have free movement of goods and services. So why can't we have integrated finance where, where, whereby we have the whole region being one big um, market for global investors? I think for us, that's a very big opportunity that we need to explore. Thank, Thank you. you, Mary. And Yinka, what, what is the opportunity and what should all of us on this panel be doing to engage a stakeholder such as you with the opportunity? Yeah, thank you. I, I, without repeating what um, the eminent um, members have said, I, I think there's an opportunity to deepen the market uh, clearly. I think Mary said it earlier, the markets are tiny. As a proportion of GDP, I think the capitalization in Nigeria is about 10%. Um, South Africa is maybe 150%, and as countries show <coughs> development, you see that the number rises. Uh, but the rest of Africa, largely below 50%. So I think that some of the steps that we should be taking uh, or be encouraging um, governments to take would be to help deepen the market so that we have sizable companies listed on the exchange and therefore we're able to attract investment and create liquidity. And in that regard, I would think that if we're able to persuade uh, African governments that have assets to privatize them, I think that will go a long way in deepening the market. Um, again, from Lagos where I see it, I see that the Nigerian government has a lot of assets, dying or dead assets, that we continue to invest money in year in, year out. Rather than investing in some of those assets, I would think that it makes better business sense to have them list privatized and listed on the stock exchange. Therefore, we free those funds to invest in primary health care. We free the funds to invest in education and other things that would benefit larger population, larger part of our population. Also, when we have the companies listed, I think invariably governance will get better. Absolutely. Governance will improve. Those companies will be better managed, and therefore we will be able to employ more and more people. So it's it's like a cycle that feeds on itself. So if there's one single opportunity that I see from Lagos, I hope it's true for the rest of Africa. But from Lagos, where I see it, I think that's one single opportunity. All the companies, whether in oil and gas, whether in telecommunications, they can we can facilitate and have them listed on the stock, on the various stock exchanges. Uh, I think that there is nobody in this room who will disagree with you. Uh, we all espouse, we live by the virtue of listing. Um, is there something that all of us can do to go out and get more companies to list? Um, it would be great. Salua, as the advisor, I'm going to give you, you know, the final slug on this, on this particular question. And then I'm going to ask, if I may, all of you in the audience to put your hand up and come forward uh, with one, with a challenge or with an opportunity uh, to ask my panelists about. So start thinking now while I ask, while we go to Salua. Salua. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I just want to echo very quickly what uh, the VP of uh, the Vice President of Nigeria said this uh, morning, and it's pretty clear. Africa is the last frontier market. So if there's any investors within Africa or outside Africa that is looking at capitalizing on the overall continent growth, they have to come to Africa. And if they're not looking at it, they must look at it now. So the opportunities are absolutely tremendous, which means that it, it gives uh, the exchanges, um, again, the opportunity to market themselves and to tell the story of Africa as it should be. Because there's a big, again, a big mismatch between the perception outside of Africa than the reality on the ground. And there's a big gap that needs to be uh, sort of uh, uh, 
uh, fulfilled. And I believe exchanges have that, uh, that uh, responsibility to do so, uh, together with uh, policy makers and regulators, etc. So the way to do that, of course, is uh, interacting with uh, investors, uh, just within the continent, of course, but also outside of the continent, through roadshows and roundtables, and getting them to really understand First of all, from the exchange standpoint, as we are talking about you know, getting the growth there, is to get the exchanges to talk about what, what they are doing to ensure that they increase uh, uh, liquidity, what regulations are they putting in place. I think we've all mentioned uh, you know, governance is very important, uh, but also understanding the upcoming listing, so bringing more transparency there. So the story has to be told within the, uh, by the exchanges to uh, the outside world. I think that's very important. And linking to that, of course, is the uh, uh, ensuring that when we look at uh, Africa, I mean, when investors look at Africa from, from the outside, um, is to give them the ability to uh, tap into a bigger sort of pool of uh, liquidity and bigger market. And I think we've seen a lot, Marie, just to as well, as well echo to what you said, is the integration of exchanges uh, is very important. That's an in initiative that has been undertaken for quite some time. Whether it has been successful or not, I think that could be probably be another panel discussion. But I just want to highlight a few of them, as uh, Mary pointed out. So there is the um, African Leakages project. That is a project that is driven by, uh, obviously, Asia with Oscar, uh, linking about six, I believe it's six markets that are more or less, have more or less the same standards. Um, and that will provide, hopefully, you know, when this becomes into place, the ability for issuers to have more confidence to list. So we should see, hopefully, greater from the issuer side, hopefully, uh, uh, companies more listed, in, uh, more listing, sorry, from companies onto, um, onto that common market. Uh, from the investor side, it will provide them, of course, the ability to, uh, to, to tap into different markets uh, within one single infrastructure. Um, there's different also different initiatives that are also undertaken, but more at a sub-regional level. Uh, in the southern African market, you have within SADC, the Southern African Development Committee, you have COSI, uh, which is a com uh, committee of um, uh, stock exchanges uh, within uh, the southern region that are looking at integrating the market. Again, whether it's successful or not, that's a different matter, but there's a lot of initiatives at the sub-regional level, and again, I mean, we're in, uh, we're in Nigeria, so I'm going to have to talk about WACMIG, the West African Capital Market Integration Committee, that I believe is led by uh, Felix, uh, the CEO of, uh, of BRVM, that is looking at, uh, as well, different phases of uh, integration for those markets, getting brokers to, uh, um, to encourage sorry, cross-border trading uh, within, those, uh, within those jurisdictions. And I believe Morocco is going to be part of it, as it has... Uh, uh, put the application through to, uh, to ECOAS. So all of those initiatives are massive amounts of opportunities to encourage more uh, flows coming from within Africa as well as uh, from outside of Africa. Thank you, Salua. We don't, I will take, I will accept two questions from the floor. We uh, are obviously uh, running over already and I'm going to try and keep us marginally more on track. Um, two questions, um, put your hand up please, we have a mic. Um, and I will accept two questions for the panel before we close. I have to say that I agree with what Selwa was saying, that uh, we can talk about integration of, uh, of markets and bringing in liquidity, et cetera, but it all ultimately is going to depend on the products that you offer. And, um, and when you look at the totality of Africa, there may be very, very good opportunities, but individual markets have all kinds of different restrictions and all kinds of different issues associated with it. So my question really is how, in addition to the cloud, do I believe, um, and I'm curious to know what the panel believes, that whether or not the cloud is the ultimate vehicle technology effectively is what is going to drive integration. Because it overcomes the issue of the flag. Everybody could have their own exchange, but they can all be integrated through flag, through cloud technology. And, um, and that way, exchanges that can't afford that kind of technology can have it. They can market Africa as a unified entity and it can also provide opportunities for blockchain, for other kinds of things like uh, AI, etc. I mean, we, I, as a goal, will have everything we do cloud eligible within five years. So my question to the panel, or the challenge is, how can that be sold here? There's always been a dream of Pan-Africanism. There has always been interference with that happening um, because of 
the desire, understandably so, for people to have their own flag and the stock market is in fact a flag. Do you believe that cloud technology is a way to ultimately go, move towards pan-Africanism? That's a great question. And in fact, we'll just, be, if I can ask you all to be quite brief in your responses, um, but why don't we go first with you, Karim? Well, a very interesting question, uh, Sandy. Uh, yeah, sure, technology is an enabler, but there has to be uh, the political will also to move towards further integration. Uh, I think the technology without the will uh, is not going to do it. I mean, you need the technology, yes, I agree, but you need more, more than that, the political will to really integrate these markets and to remove obstacles that exist throughout Africa uh, towards mobilizing funds across boundaries. I mean, you know, you know very well that uh, it's not that easy to move uh, investments from one region to another in Africa. Even within the same region, it doesn't, it's not that easy. So from one region to another, it proves sometimes even more difficult. So I think we need first to remove the obstacles to the funds moving around the continent before we, uh, we use the existing cloud technology uh, to facilitate uh, market integration. So I think there has to be political will. Yeah. Great, thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, I wanted to add that um, uh, clearly one way to help in my mind would be I think Ike mentioned it, I caught the tail end of his submission. Exchanges need to demutualize because if they do, they become like businesses. So the same way you have um, serious multinationals operating across boundaries. You have Lafarge, now Lafarge Africa, because they are companies. So I believe that if exchanges were to demutualize, then they are able to better navigate the restrictions that our governments across Africa have placed. Because there are businesses now looking for opportunities, there are businesses seeking to be more efficient. So I think exchanges need to get there quickly so that they can make some of these things happen. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, like, oh, sorry. I will also like to say that integration of African exchanges of the market. It reminds me of when private companies are begged to come to the market. They usually, they don't want to come to the market because they want to, to be at that their little corner, you know, just answering chief executive um, officer and chairman, as the case may be here. To integrate um, exchanges of the, of the markets of the region like he rightly says it takes much more than political will it takes determination it takes saying what what is the benefit it takes seeing the benefit even when you haven't you know started experiencing it yet you know to to say let's come together you know and merge and become one it's not going to, to remove the national pride that you have as a country. It's not going to say, close down your exchanges, as it was suggested some time ago when you know, um, we were trying to have integration at WACMIC. The exchanges will still be there, but we're talking about this issue of technology that he's talking about, where technology can do everything, and you still have the 34 stock exchanges that you're having. But we're talking about a common market that will bring greater benefit, you know, to the region or the continent, as the case may be. That is what we're talking about. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, Gareth. Okay, sure. Look, I think that um, there's a great say that uh, in French is je t'aime moi non plus. <laughs> so, working together, integrating at the end of the day, certainly it's an initiative that is taken of taken by different sub-regional um, engagement as well as GLP. But at the end of the day, they're there. There is still competition, and that has to be put in mind. So first of all, the level of competition within Africa. The second is the political will. It's very important, as, uh, as Carrie mentioned. And I think Sandy mentioned, the, uh, obviously, using the, the cloud, right? So a lot of countries, and I think uh, uh, Mohammed, correct me if I'm wrong, in, for instance, in Egypt, 
data and information cannot get out of the country, so everything has to be within the country. So the cloud certainly poses an issue. So unless there's changes in regulation, i.e., political will and uh, policymakers understanding that it's actually okay, uh, you know, through the use of you know exchanges and and uh, market participants to ensure that they embrace those new technologies, a new way of doing things that will actually facilitate the market, facilitate trading, uh, uh, attract more uh, investments, and um, obviously with the ultimate goal to uh, help the development of those economies in, in the you know at the end of the spectrum. So it's very very important to sort of uh, continue to engage to try and find a way to overcome those obstacles because that's actually very key. And of course, you know, obviously Sandy mentioned. Uh, the cloud, but there's many other technologies out there. I mean, right now, you know, there's, there's no regulation in some of them, uh, but that could come. Thank you. So I think we will indeed have um, a session on, uh, on technology and the enabling power. Um, I'm going to give Gareth an opportunity to answer, but can we send the mic up? Farid has it already. Uh, Gareth, you go next. We'll take a question from Farid, and then we can go to lunch. But you just, yeah, just sorry, just one comment, Sandy. I, I agree. I think technology is going to be one of the drivers. I wouldn't say it's the solution. I would say it's probably more the enabler um, to po follow up on the political will, the regulatory will. You know, I think it, it's going to take joint decisions and joint work on common standards uh, to really drive integration. I think if you were to take the example of Europe and USITS and AIFM, mm -hmm. the common set of standards for passporting investment instruments across countries, I think. That's a way to go for it. Technology will enable it. I don't think it'll solve it. Thank you. That's, that's, actually, that's actually a very nuanced approach. And from where we all sit, we hear every day that technology can do everything, including talk to you. Farid, let me let you ask your question. So um, at the end, exchanges do not work in, in vacuum. They don't work in, in the outer space. Uh, when we have international uh, economics and international trade being directed towards inward policies and protectionist policies, so alongside these areas, it would be very difficult for exchanges to, I would say, combat the entire uh, uh, international political arena, whereby you get to see the Brexit happening from uh, a nationalistic perspective and sovereignty perspective. You get to see trade wars that is happening in the various countries, and hence, exchanges will not be how can I say it, uh, uh, the game changer here. International polit politics need to change in terms of game changing and hence exchanges will be able to fight, I would say, or even promote aspects that are not even thinkable for the time being. That was just a very quick comment in this area. Thank you. I think actually that, that's a great note, in fact, to leave it and to conclude our session this afternoon. Um, Oscar, did you want to say anything? Your hand was up, no? Okay, so what I'm going to suggest to all of you in, uh, over lunch, uh, please come and find my panelists who have all given us really quite a lot to think about. Ask them your questions and I suggest that we come back in a year's time and see if our challenges and opportunities um, have indeed remained the same or if they have changed. So with that, please join me in thanking my panelists. Thank you.